The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the former CNN pundit who tells the media to get out of the newsroom. The hidden Trump voter existed all across the country. Kaylee McEnany talks about the new American revolution brewing in the country. When government didn't show up, God did in a very powerful way. Then, the ultimate betrayal. You're a shell of a person. An abused girl turns to her mother for help. It is almost as though that's it. And gets turned down. It confirms in your mind that you are worthless. Find out what saved her on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. To say the least, we're delighted you're with us. Did you watch any of the, what were they, Oscars? Yes, no. <laughs> yes and no. Yes, <laughs> yes you know, they, they had the Oscars, a nice no, feature. I, <laughs> I thought it was kind of cute. They, they had a group of people in an adjoining theater that were just looking at a regular movie, and they took some of the stars, and they had a, a hot dog throwing machine, and they... They threw hot dogs out into the audience to give them all something to eat. Wow. I mean, Classy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but they like those weird things, like the shape of water. I mean, come on. That, that was the one, the Oscar. The, the, I mean, it's weird. I mean, if it's weird or, you know, gay or whatever, they seem to like those things. But I, I don't think the audience is all that important. Well, all right, just get down to the news. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is at the White House today, and much of the uh, media focus will be on the peace process with the Palestinians. But the two leaders will also be talking about the uh, growing threat from the nation of Iran. Well, Netanyahu will be speaking to supporters of Israel while he's in Washington this week, along with Vice President Mike Pence and U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. Iran will be at the top of the agenda. Jenna Browder brings us the story from Washington. A lot is on the table for President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Most importantly, Iran's growing influence in the Middle East. As he left Israel for the United States, Netanyahu called this a very important visit, and Trump a close friend of Israel. The two leaders are expected to talk about President Obama's nuclear agreement with Iran, something they and many lawmakers consider a bad deal. The Prime Minister makes a very compelling case that the Iranian nuclear agreement as is, is not in the interest of anyone in the world other than Iran. Senator Lindsey Graham, on a recent trip to Israel, also warned about Iran's growing military and political influence in the Middle East, even close to Israel itself. I am hoping that the Trump administration, who has been a great ally of Israel, has unleashed uh, our military against ISIL, will look longer and harder in cooperation with the international community to stop what I think is a dangerous advancement by Iran throughout the region. We will all regret allowing Iran to run rampant, and the sooner we can deal with this, the better. Netanyahu also wants Trump to attend the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem that's set for May, tied into the 70th anniversary of the founding of modern Israel. Palestinians oppose the embassy move, one of the major complications, as the Trump team tries to come up with a peace deal. Adding to the situation, Trump's point man, Jared Kushner, has lost his top secret security clearance. Back in Israel, Netanyahu is facing allegations of corruption. Police arriving at his residence Friday to question him over a bribery scandal. Both he and Trump, who's dealing with the Russia investigation, say they're not concerned. Netanyahu's main focus at this pro-Israel conference will be on the threat from Iran. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, we have to face the fact that Iran uh, is a bad actor. They have been fomenting revolution. They have been the source of funds for Hezbollah and other radical groups. And they are looking to have a so-called caliphate or hegemony all the way across a wide swath of, of territory uh, that would go from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. They are, they're dangerous. And the sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with it. We can't just allow that cancer to grow and 
them to continue to take the huge amounts of money they have at their disposal and use it to fund groups. You know, there was an Iranian-backed drone that uh, came into Israeli airspace from Syria, but it was from Iran. And uh, here it's in Israel, and they shot it down but as a drone, but it meant that that could carry some kind of nuclear weapon. Iran has said over and over again that they want to destroy Israel. They've made no secret about it. So anyhow, it's something that we, we need to uh, work on. Well, President Trump is uh, standing by one of his recent decisions that's uh, been in the headlines to impose new tariffs on steel and aluminum imports. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this real clearly. I am for free trade, and I think the idea of penalizing all the people that use steel, you know, everybody sooner or later will use steel. We all use steel. Steel's in everything. So who do we penalize when we put tariffs on imported steel? We don't hurt the people who make the steel because they're so efficient. There was an editorial today about how efficient there's a plant in Austria that, that has very few people and very modern technology to turn out their steel products. So why in the world would we put tariff on imported steel and aluminum when all the consumers in America will get hurt by it? That is not a smart move, Ephraim. Well, Pat, the president defended his new tariff in a tweet Sunday saying we are on the losing side of almost all trade deals. Our friends and enemies have taken advantage of the U.S. for many years. Our steel and aluminum industries are dead. Sorry, it's time for a change. Make America great again. Main economists and politicians have criticized the president's move, saying it will mean higher prices. But the president's supporters are disputing that. At least as far as anyone can tell, there wasn't a great deal of consultation outside of the Commerce Department, and even there was significant dissent and surprise, as I understand it. I mean, this is a very, very important decision, and it's one that could have long-term ramifications. If you look at a 10% tariff on aluminum, six-pack of beer or Coke, that's a cent and a half. If you look at the other end of the spectrum, Boeing 777. It's one of the best airliners ever made. It's a $330 million aircraft. We're talking about an increase in costs at, at the worst of $25,000. So when you're talking about these massive costs or whatever is a fact, it's not. Some congressional Republicans have urged the president to rethink the impact the tariffs could have. Some liberal Democrats think they may have a campaign issue to use against Republicans in this fall's congressional elections. President Trump's tax cut. Some high-profile liberals are calling for the tax cuts to be repealed just two months after President Trump signed them into law. Those Democrats are betting big that repealing the tax cuts will give them a clear populist message. But others, including Democrats in red states, aren't sure it's a good strategy. And even those who do want to get rid of the tax cuts say they'd only repeal certain parts, saying tax breaks for billionaires and large corporations must go. The tax cut plan is likely to be a central issue for both parties in this year's midterms. Pat? Well, if I were the president, I'd be running on the fact that I have put money into your paycheck, that your uh, stock uh, portfolio was up, that uh, your 401s are up, that everything you've got is up, and <clears throat> you're actually getting more money in that paycheck because you're paying lower taxes. I tell you, if I were a Republican strategist, I'd be you know, rubbing my hands in glee. The Democrats would be such fools as to run against the tax cut. Can you imagine a campaign where one guy says, I'm going to raise your taxes, and the other says, I'm going to keep your uh, tax cuts and make it easier for you. Can you imagine where the voters are going to go? I mean, oh, good grief. How foolish can you get? Ephraim. Pat, California could soon become the first state to require its university health care centers to offer abortion pills to students. But pro-life advocates fear the move could only encourage abortion among those students. Heather Sells brings us the story. None of the University of California or Cal State campuses currently offer abortion services on campus, but this bill would change that. UC San Francisco estimates more than 1,000 California college students get an abortion each month, adding up to some 12,000 a year. 
In a recent survey, most campus health centers indicated they present all options to pregnant students, but anti-abortion advocates believe otherwise. We have found that many times when a woman finds out that she's pregnant on campus, she doesn't know where to turn, and it's, abortion is presented as the easiest solution. Abortion advocates, on the other hand, say it's too hard for college students to choose abortion, arguing that forcing them to go to off-campus sites like Planned Parenthood clinics is a barrier. That's why they're pushing State Bill 320, to make the pill freely available and eliminate any transportation problems. While state senators have already passed the bill, university administrators worry about paying for it. They fear extra costs for liability insurance, medical training, and round-the-clock phone support for emergencies. Students for Life share the concern, especially when it comes to women's health and well-being. We're concerned that she would be taking this pill on campus and not be able to distinguish a common side effect versus an emergency, versus needing emergency care. If this bill passes, it would set a precedent as no other state currently forces its campus health centers to offer abortion services. Reporting in San Diego, Heather Sell, CBN News. Eye-opening report. Pat. Thank you very much. Did you notice the wind in the last weekend? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Did any of the trees in your yard fall down? Or? Not in my yard, but my neighbors. The neighbors' trees? A tree fell down. A well, we live in a, in an area that was a former woods, so. Yeah, but even so. Even so. Mm -hmm. Well, in Washington, I think they, they shut, they uh, told government workers they didn't have to come to work because it was so dangerous. Yeah, and uh, well, planes, I think, also over the weekend were not flying. Oh, over a thousand. Uh, flights canceled in New York, particularly. I mean, yes. what do they call it? A blast cyclone? It was just some kind of a weird storm. I don't know, but it was. It was. Oh, what? Somebody's talking to me. Here. Say it again. I, I still didn't hear you. Yeah, I. I bomb a, cyclone. I'm bomb sorry. Cyclone. Bomb, bomb cyclone. All right, a there bomb. There was a lot of damage, and you know. Well, there there's were... one coming. Another one. Bomb cyclone. It'll hit the Northeast. It hit a, a, a swath all the way up to the East Coast, yeah. especially on I-95. And in Washington, as I say, the, the workers were told you don't have to come to work because the power lines were down, trees were down. It was but another one coming. Yeah. Another one coming. Here's Ephraim with that story. Pat, as you said, another major winter storm could be making its way to the East Coast and parts of the Midwest. States like New York, Maryland, and Pennsylvania are still recovering from last week's nor'easter. It brought heavy floods, strong winds, and heavy snow in some areas. And it left more than a million and a half homes and businesses without power. But forecasters say people should be getting ready for another storm that could hit in the next few days, dropping between 6 to 12 inches of snow in Montana as it moves across the U.S. to the Midwest and the Northeast. Pat? Well, that's what happens when you have global warming. It gets hotter. And well, sort of, in some places. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So the weather is screwy. It really is. I mean, what are we going to say? Well, it's but, intense at best. Yeah. All right. First well, we've got a story coming up now that you wouldn't believe. You can imagine what happened in the newsrooms of the liberal media when the election was showing that Trump was winning. Yeah. You know, we forecast here, we, our, our guys went out and we, we did a, a survey state by state, and I was bold to say that Trump was going to win because of uh, certain states that he was going to carry. Well, I think uh, we've got a story about that now. We do. Coming up, Kaylee McEnany was often the token Republican on CNN, but that doesn't mean she was fighting alone. Faith is the answer, and knowing that when I argued that Jesus was sitting there with me and it wasn't me um, against eight, it was, there was at least two against eight. The RNC spokeswoman reveals what's helped her and many Americans get through tough times when we come back. Well, a lot of people were surprised at that election. The results of the presidential election took many people by surprise. As a matter of fact, I think almost everybody in the media said Trump was going to lose and Hillary was going to win. But one political pundit who was working at CNN, of all places, 
that she was confident Trump would win. Why? Well, in her book, The New American Revolution, The Making of a Populist Movement, Raleigh McEnany tells what she learned while traveling the country and why she thinks the landscape of political campaign is forever changed. Following the 2016 election, Kaylee McEnany, author of The New American Revolution, took a job with the Republican National Committee and wanted to learn more about what motivated Trump voters to support such an outsider for president. As she traveled the country, speaking to Americans about major issues like terrorism, immigration, and religious liberty. She learned that instead of relying on politicians for answers, they leaned on Jesus Christ. When government didn't show up, God did in a very powerful way. And I'm a Christian myself. I didn't set out to find Christians, but the men and women I found who've gone through such unbelievable hurt, um, God reached out to them, Jesus Christ, and got them through their darkest hour. When you discovered this trend and that all these people happen to be Christians, do you feel like God was leading you to them? Yes, God was at work in this book and the New American Revolution. I, I, that was so clear to me when each person I met, so I interviewed four families who had lost loved ones, and every single one of those families, I said, do you happen to be a person of faith? I started catching on to a trend and they said, of course, Jesus is what got me through. The book starts with the untold story of Kim Copeland, who lost her husband, Sean, and son, Brody, in the Nice terror attack, which killed 85 people. And all of a sudden, she heard Sean shout, get out of the way, get out of the way, there's a truck coming. And he dives forward and he pushes Brody out of the way. And in the process, both he and his son get hit. For the next 90 minutes, as he waited for medical care, Sean repeatedly asked his family about his son. His last words on this earth were, I know where Brody is. Mm -hmm. And Kim said to me mm -hmm. that in that moment, she knows that Sean saw Brody in heaven and Brody said, Daddy, come, come be with me. The family already sees more of God's handiwork in their story, as Kim started a scholarship in honor of her late son to help others. To see how amid hurt, her first thought was how to bless others. Um, it was a story of redemption and hope and, and Christ at work in the darkest, darkest hour of someone's life. Kaylee doesn't just share stories from others about yeah. issues facing our country today. She also writes about her experiences as an outspoken conservative at Georgetown University and Harvard Law School. You're not allowed to speak if you're a conservative um, at Harvard or elsewhere on, on campuses across this country. Why did you decide to support President Trump pretty early on? You know, I recognized we needed a fighter. And you talked about Harvard Law School. Well, I was on Harvard Law's campus when 2016 happened, when the election happened. And I felt like I couldn't speak out. And you felt like you had to hide your faith. And you felt like you had to hide your conservative viewpoint or your grades would suffer or your peers would condemn you. Kaylee's days of feeling outnumbered were only beginning. After graduating law school, she worked for CNN as a commentator and often found herself as the sole conservative on panels of six to eight people. Yet Kaylee says she never felt alone. It's definitely faith is the answer and knowing that when I argued that Jesus was sitting there with me and it wasn't me um, against eight, it was, there was at least two against eight. It also helped when she learned while she might have been one of the few Republicans, Kaylee was not the only Christian. I hear this voice ring out, Kaylee, I love your cross. And it was said publicly and in front of everyone in the green room. And it was Van Jones, who I might not agree with, but is someone uh, who's a Christian and someone who's a man of faith. And little did he know that when he said to me, you know, I love your cross, it was the same day that someone had told me to take off my cross. Trump has 238 votes. Hillary Clinton has 215. You need 270. Then on election night at CNN headquarters, Kaylee watched as moods quickly changed from excitement to shock. I don't think the press has learned anything since the 2016 election because the same tactics they used then, which was to marginalize the president, to call him racist and xenophobic and any word they could come up with, the same thing they did to Ronald Reagan, that's still the talking point. That's still the order of the day with the press. As she celebrated the Trump victory that night, others at CNN quietly let her know they too supported the new commander in chief. That was the hidden Trump voter um, right there in CNN and the hidden Trump voter existed all across the country. Her advice to the media, leave the newsroom. I still think that many members of the media haven't left the confines of that newsroom and gone out and spoke to the American people.
As spokeswoman for the Republican National Committee, Kaylee regularly talks about the president's actions and agenda on multiple platforms. She believes there is a side of him the media doesn't see or let their viewers see. Ben Carson said after that Access Hollywood tape came out before that key debate, he saw Donald Trump pray for forgiveness. And he said that this is someone who is a man of faith. Kaylee hopes that in a time of deep political division in our country, readers will see the stories in this book and remember that while politicians may fail them, they can always trust in God. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. The book is called The New American Revolution. It's written by a graduate from Harvard Law School who didn't dare to speak out. We were able to speak boldly. And by the way, our, our team went out and did some research. And when we analyzed state after state after state, it became clear that the Electoral College was within the president's grasp. And they kept saying on, on CNN and, and Fox and so forth, you know, the path to victory is impossible, et cetera. He doesn't have a path to victory. And I knew he did have one. Well, she did, too. You want to read this book, The New American Revolution. She went out and talked to people all across the country and found out what, what is it going on in our nation. There's a new revolution building right now in the United States of America. You ought to get this book wherever books are sold, okay? Fascinating. Amen. All right. Well, coming up, the dark secret hidden within one child's innocent game. I would say, I need to go play into the woods, and she would know, or vice versa. See what they were trying to escape from when we come back. Hey, you're watching the 700 Club, and then we just first of the week. We were simply delighted to have you with us, and uh, we've got another amazing story. From the time when she was just three years old, Tina Beauchamp lived in fear. Her dad wasn't around. Mom was known to just disappear for most of the day. And so Tina was powerless to stop from being sexually abused by a sibling. This trauma haunted Tina for decades until she was learned or she has learned that she had a hope and a future. It was always after something horrible happened. I would say, I need to go play into the woods, and she would know, or vice versa. Tina Beauchamp and her twin sister played their game of make-believe often, one pretending to be lost, the other coming to her rescue. More than a game, it was an escape from a sexually and physically abusive sibling. It was very confusing because as a little kid, you have really no idea what's going on. As you get a little older, this, this, this isn't right. Something's, something's wrong here. And you start to think that you are just trash and that you're not worth anything. Tina grew up in a poor neighborhood in California with a single mother of five. She hardly knew her father. Their mother neglected them, and the only attention she gave came through harsh discipline. I just remember just being sad all the time. It's like, where is that love? You get up every day and you're a shell of a person. There's nothing to look forward to. The one time Tina worked up the nerve to say something about the abuse, her mother did nothing about it. It is the ultimate betrayal, and it is almost as though that's it. If your own mother won't defend you or try and do something about it, it confirms in your mind that you are worthless. The sexual abuse stopped when Tina stood up to her abuser at age 10, but the chaos and physical abuse at home continued. At 13, she downed a bottle of aspirin trying to escape the pain. When that failed, she turned to promiscuity, drugs, and alcohol. It was like, oh my gosh, this thing is, I'm numb when, when I'm doing this. I was much more free. I was able to laugh. Um, things became funny. 
At 16, with no ambitions or hope for her future, she dropped out of school. And at 18, she married a physically and verbally abusive man. The day we got married, something sort of broke in me, and I, I remember just breaking down and crying. And the people that were there thought, oh, she's so happy, she's crying. That's not why I was crying. I was crying because I felt like I had sealed my fate. Like, well, this is the best I can do. This is what I'm good for, is to be abused. They moved to the East Coast to be closer to her husband's family. After earning her GED and landing a job in banking, Tina poured herself into her work. I would go to work and I would do an excellent job because I wanted that praise. My boss has always loved me, so that became my new drug, my new escapism. Afraid her husband would hurt her if she tried to leave, she endured the marriage. After nine years, two of her sisters gave her the courage and a plane ticket to leave and fly back to California. But soon she was back to finding escape through drugs and unhealthy relationships. At this point, I'm still trying to fill myself with something. And all this other stuff over here to the left is not working. It works temporarily, but it wears off. In her 30s, Tina decided to volunteer at a local church's ministry, thinking that helping others might fill the void. She even began attending Sunday services on occasion. Then one morning, she woke up, feeling a darkness she'd never felt before. There was something that came on me. It felt like an oppression. And I had been depressed before, so I knew what that felt like. This was very different. I woke up with it. I was at work with it, and it was, it, it really is hard to describe because it is such a dark place. The feeling got worse, and she decided to go to a woman's Bible study. The study was on the book of James. Because this darkness, this oppression was so severe, I said, I've got to try it. I have to try something. I'm desperate. This darkness is on me, even though I'm opening the Bible up. They asked me to read, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, okay. So as, as soon as I start reading James, that oppression went away. And that darkness never came back. Wanting to know more, she started digging into the Bible for answers. One night, she arrived early to Bible study and noticed a scripture reference on the board. Oh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Okay. So I looked it up and it was like, that was written for me. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And I thought, oh my gosh, you really are pursuing me. Finally, she understood that her only hope would come through salvation in Jesus Christ. Soon after, she made a decision. All that stuff that happened to me in the past, he's renewed me as his daughter. And what Jesus did on the cross, him going step by step, carrying that cross for us, it hit me in that moment and I fell down on my knees. Jesus, no matter what happens in this life and no matter what has happened in this life, you're it, you're it for me. You're that thing that I've been searching for for so long. After giving her life to Christ, she realized she still needed to heal from her past. She sought counseling from a Christian therapist and asked God for help. I remember my first counseling appointment, and I said, Jesus, please come with me. Well, he was already there, but uh, hold my hand. I need for you to hold my hand going in here. As she grew in her faith, Tina overcame the hurt from her past. She now works with victims of human trafficking and has plans to open a women's shelter. She says that Jesus took away all of her pain and gave her purpose instead. He's using what I went through to help women now that don't know him, uh, that don't feel that they have value or worth. And I'm there to say that you do. You absolutely do. What a message. You know something? You are worth something. You are precious. You are precious. And many women, for example, they, they, they have been abused and they think they're worthless. 
And that leads them into drugs and promiscuity and prostitution and all the rest of the stuff that uh, is, is so uh, debilitating. You are precious. God says you are precious. You are made in His image. And He loves you. And that's the big thing that you've got to understand is that the God who created this world, the God who put the stars in the heavens, the God who caused everything else to be, this God says, I love you. You're my child. And I will receive you unto myself. You don't have to be victim of abuse. You don't have to feel like you're worthless. And if you want to have a role in him, you want to be part of his family, I want you to pray with me right now. Right this minute. Don't go anywhere. Right now. Just bow your head, and I want you to repeat after me the same words and meet them in your heart. These words, Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Say it. The Lord Jesus Christ. You know what's been done to me. You know what I've experienced. You know the hurt that I have suffered mentally and spiritually and physically. You know what's been done to me. And you know how I feel. And right now, I just want to affirm that you have said, I am a child of God. And I give myself to you, Lord Jesus, from this moment on. I want to be your, fa your servant. I want to be part of your family. I want to be in the Father's house. I receive you, Lord. Come now. Take me. And from this moment, I'm yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to give you something. I know you want to start and say, well, what do I do next? Well, some time ago, I went into our audio room, and I did a compact disc. <clears throat> it's about, I think, about 73 minutes. But it's very concentrated teaching about what it means to be a new creature in Christ, what it means when you've accepted the Lord, and what happens if you make a mistake and if you need prayer and so forth. It's all here. I'll give this to you free, and along with a little book that has the scriptures uh, uh, that I've alluded to in this uh, CD, I'll give this to you, no, no financial obligation whatsoever. Would you please call? Say, I prayed with Pat. I've given my heart to the Lord. It's 1-800, if you're not in this uh, area code, 1-800, and it's 700-7000. Real easy to remember, 700-7000, 700-7000. Call right now and say, I've just found the Lord. Somebody's on the phone who will be rejoicing at that good news. Terry? Well, still ahead, a brand new way to look at one of the oldest prayers in the Bible. Learn more about the priestly prayer of blessing when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Possible progress between North and South Korea. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un met with a special delegation of South Korean officials today. South Korea's president sent the delegation for talks on how to ease nuclear tensions and promote peace on the Korean peninsula. It is the first time the North Korean leader has met with South officials. CBN's Orphan's Promise has brought hope and joy to kids in rural Kenya. A local school called Missions of Hope recently hosted more than 1,100 young students at an outreach festival. The festival included a sing-along led by Superbook's Gizmo and Bible lessons. Students had the chance to proudly show off everything they learned in their classes. Orphan's Promise also provided the children with a nutritious snack to take home. You can learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com slash international. We'll be back with much more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. In 1979, a pair of silver amulets were found opposite of the Temple Mount. The small cracked and corroded artifacts were from the 6th or 7th century BC, some 400 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls. They contained the priestly blessing from the Book of Numbers, the most significant prayer in all of the Bible. 
Warren Marcus is a Messianic Jewish believer and the vice president of Sid Roth's Messianic Vision. He believes he's discovered the ancient secret to the only prayer in the Bible written by God himself. That prayer is for us today. He wants to proclaim that prayer. When we say it in his name, in his person, it's him speaking. In his new book, The Priestly Prayer of Blessing, Warren shows us how to usher in the power of God in a way that we have never experienced before. Well, Warren Marcus joins us now, and we welcome you back home, really. It's good to <laughs> be back here. home, yes. You know, you have written the Priestly Prayer of the Blessing, and you say that it's the ancient secret of the only prayer in the Bible written by God Himself. And yes. most people's initial response would be, well, what about the Lord's Prayer? Right. How do you differentiate the well, two? Well, the Lord's Prayer is interesting because Jesus, of course, was the Son of the living God. Of course. But He was teaching us how to pray to the Father. He said, our Father who art in heaven, mm -hmm. holy is your name. And that's very important when he said, holy is your name. What does that mean? Because yes. in the English, he says, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he was praying to the Father and he was teaching us about, we can have a relationship with the, with the God of Israel as being our heavenly Father. But the priestly blessing called the Aaronic blessing yes. was really God praying for. Well, actually what it was is, God, just like he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, he wrote this prayer and gave it to Moses. And he said, you can't pray this, Moses, over the people of Israel. I want the high priest yeah. to pray it over him. Every day I want them to have this prayer prayed over them. And when this prayer is applied to them and pronounced over them, I will put my name, very important, upon them and will bless them. And what I found out in the Hebrew, Shem, the word for name doesn't mean a title. It means the very person of, my very person, my holy character, my power and authority. Wow. So when the high priest would pray, who was the only intermediary between God and man in the old covenant, he's the only one that went into the presence once a year on the day of atonement into the glory of the Father, the Shekinah glory. He came and prayed a prayer over them. Didn't touch them, but he prayed and pronounced it over them every day. And the result of it was a shedding forth, I believe, as I'm in the studies and in the book, you find out more about the glory, a little portion of the glory. Matter of fact, when he held his hands out, it's in the form almost of the ark of the cherubim on the ark. Mm. And so there was a shedding forth. And here's what happened for 40 years. What I found out was they had divine supply. Yeah. They had manna from heaven. Right? When they got tired of eating manna burgers, they got quail. quail right. That's Kentucky fried chicken from yeah. heaven. <laughs> you know, but the key is they got water when they spoke to a rock enough to feed their flocks, their and children multiply. You know, also, their stuff. clothing and sandals never wore never out, wore which out. is pretty astonishing. Not one feeble among them. Perfect health, divine protection, angelic protection. Wow. So I was trying to say, if that happened for them, I mean, I love the prayer when I read it. The prayer Pray is beautiful. Us, well, it's just that in our Bibles, our English Bibles, we have the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm. Now, I read that, but I had my friend Rick Amato, who was on the site. He's an evangelist. He calls me up. He was on that site where the amulets were discovered. And on the amulet, I have a, a replica of it. In the ancient paleo is what the prayer is. Wow. The oldest prayer, the oldest intact Bible scripture, the only prayer in the entire Bible that God himself wrote. But he had it prayed over him in the Hebrew. And he calls me up, Warren, the name of God is upon me. Warren, I'm totally transformed. And he's going through this and I'm well, going. You say that very thing, the translation, something's lost in the right, translation. Right. What that, is it? That's what I think. So when the Hebrew is pronounced over, and I find that even when I had like meetings and I have the ironic blessing sung. I, I have a Paul Wilbur recording yes. of it that I had done and I play it over people, whether they're Methodist, Assemblies of God, Jewish people, they just begin sobbing and yeah. weeping. So the power is in the meaning of the prayer. The Hebrew has it. So what we have, the Lord bless you, is very abstract. Shine my face upon you. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. When I started investigating the Hebrew, the prayer is this long, not this short. Yeah. <laughs> and so what it is, is like the word bless. Just to take the word bless. It's barach, barach in Hebrew, which means to kneel in front of someone mm. and to make yourself available to minister and give them gifts. Well, that's a picture. So isn't Jesus, 
He would, Barak is the, illustrated in Jesus, the son of God, kneeling in front of his disciples, washing their feet mm -hmm. and saying, what is it? The greatest leader is the servant of all. So the father, I mean, when this prayer is prayed, there's a picture of the father kneeling in front of us. Mm -hmm. and people get very offended at, you mean the father, the holy God, you know, of Israel is kneeling. He kneels as a father with his arms outstretched, mm -hmm. beckoning his spiritual son and daughter to come to him, to, to, to let him wrap his arms around you, to give you the things he wants to give you so you, you could accomplish your God-given destiny and purpose on earth. It wasn't until you really began digging into the meaning yes. of all of this that God began to reveal this to you. You talk in the book about the fact that there are, is it seven ways that we can pursue meaning in the Word of God? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I won't get into all seven and I'll yeah. say it very simply, <laughs> but you could read the promises of God and you'll be blessed, but then you can meditate on scriptures. Mm -hmm. When you meditate on it, it's like you're repeating it. And you're making it like a conscious thing of that, of that scripture of the day. But then there's the washing of the word. Our minds are washed and transformed. Then there's the writing of it by the Holy Spirit on our hearts where it becomes ingrained in us. And then there's us being able to operate in that flow. But the greatest, the greatest importation is, the greatest understanding and importation is when the scriptures become alive, like Jesus was the word that became alive when the presence of God yeah. comes through the scriptures and makes himself known to us. So the blessing isn't just an out knowing about something, it's a knowing the God himself. Yes. And, and I find that this is the whole secret to whether it's Jesus, you're, it's really, we're supposed to have a fullness of revelation and knowledge and intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, when I when I was reading the seven things levels. that you levels that you you invite people to participate in, I was thinking of the scripture where he says, you know, you'll find me when you seek me yes. with all of your heart, not just the reading of, but right. actually the delving into, the studying, the immersing in, the, the contemplating, all yes. of it. Well, you can learn more by getting the book, The Priestly Prayer of the Blessing. It's fascinating. It's available nationwide. Warren, thank you for your work in this and for culling out truth for all of us and then showing us how to get there ourselves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, well, coming up, your email questions. Bill asks, do you feel it's wrong to pray for death to reach heaven when you're tired of life? Pat's going to Weigh in on that and more in another round of Your Questions, Honest Answers, and it's coming up. Anna tried to protect her family only to see her son wind up in the ICU. He needed emergency care that she couldn't afford. But Anna didn't need to spend a dime because a team from CBN was there to help. 29-year-old Anna just wants a safe place to raise her children. She left an abusive husband, then fled the war in Ukraine. But now Anna's children face another danger. The conditions in our home are very bad. We have no stove to cook. We have nowhere to wash our clothes. I bring water from outside and heat it with boilers to cook or wash. I am always afraid of the danger to my children from the boilers. One day, Anna went to get water from the well and asked her eldest son to watch his brother. It only took a few seconds and an inquisitive toddler to create a disaster. My elder son ran out and cried, Ma, come fast, David got burned by the hot water. David was rushed to the nearest hospital with life-threatening burns. I cried and cried and I worried. I just wanted my child to be all right but I knew I had no money to pay for this medical treatment. But the very day that David arrived, CBN staff members were there to deliver supplies. They heard about his accident and agreed to pay the full cost of his medical care. David was rushed into surgery and received state-of-the-art burn treatment, including artificial skin that hastens recovery. Within several weeks, David was back home and was as playful as ever. He's a fine and healthy boy now. I want to say thank you for helping my son get well. To ensure that Anna's home will be safe for the future, 
we gave her a brand new stove for cooking and a washing machine. Draplit, many, many thanks for the electric stove and the washing machine. Because of your gifts, my home is finally safe. I have no more worries. Thank you. A single mom doing the best that she can, but no possibility for her to pay for the medical needs of her little boy. You came right into the middle of that CBN Partners, and you gave her not just an answer to her very immediate need, but you brought her hope. You know, you let her know that someone knows of her, cares about her, and is doing something. You brought her the love of God. That's always shared everywhere that we go, and you make that possible. We want to say thank you. If you're not a 700 Club partner, today is a great day to join because we have so many needs that come to us from around the world. And we can say yes when you say yes. So let's say yes together and make a difference. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club partner. So will you join with thousands of others who are changing the world in the name of Jesus Christ? Our number's toll free. It's so simple to call. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. And listen, when you do, our way of saying thank you to you for caring about others is to send you this latest DVD that Pat's done. It's called Answered Prayer. And he talks in here about the significance of prayer, how it's been very practically and powerfully used in his 50 plus years of ministry. You want to have it. It'll be a great blessing to you. And you'll have the satisfaction of knowing you're touching others' lives at the same time. So 1-800-700-7000. So time for some All right, questions. Let's take some questions. Answers. We're, we're ready to go. Okay, Pat, this first one comes from Bill, who says, do you feel it's wrong to pray for death to reach heaven when you're tired of life? Well, I don't think so. Um, you know, Elijah prayed that the Lord would take his life. You know, there, there, there are many who, who were so tired out that they just said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I, I can't go on anymore. Take my life. And then it's up to the Lord to give them life. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong in doing that. I mean, we people want to be with the Lord, so. But I think suicide is a different matter. So is it wrong to take your life? That's something else. To pray for something, that's that's one thing. All right. Yeah, this is Mitchell who says, "How can God heal a broken heart? I've had my heart broken in the past, and it still hurts." What What is uh, Jesus when he was reading about the Messiah? He said. You know, he was reading from Isaiah that my message is to heal the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. uh, he, that's one of the things that he has commissioned us to do, to help the brokenhearted. And uh, people have had heartbreak. They've had heartbreak because of the death of a loved one. They've had heartbreak because of romantic uh, uh, trouble, whatever it happened to be. There's so many. They've had heartbreak because they haven't got the uh, job they were looking for and where they want to be in life, and they're heartbroken. And God said, I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. So is that what God wants to do? That's what Jesus said he was here to do. All right. Okay, this is Janice who says, a member of the Bible study that I'm attending recently said that Jesus did not know that he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. I questioned this statement based on Jesus' statements that he knew his time had not yet come, that he cautioned others to not tell about his miracles, and that Peter said Jesus was the Messiah. What's your take on all of this? Well, I think the, the person who was talking to you is in, in, incorrect. Uh, I think after his uh, baptism, there was an anointing of the Holy Spirit that gave him a new appreciation of miraculous power. But you remember, he's, <clears throat> he said when he was 12 years old, was, I have to be about my father's business. He knew exactly uh, who he was. But as he grew older, the, the ministry that was given to him was uh, elucidated, if you will. And he... he grew an appreciation of it. But he, he, you know, what did he say to Peter? He said, you know, get behind me, mm -hmm. Satan. You know, you don't savor the things of God. Okay, this is a viewer who says, since we have Jesus as our primary example, I'm sure that he would never tell us to do something that he wouldn't do himself because he's ultimate Lord and ultimate leader. In Matthew 18, 20 and 21, it says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? 
No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. So in this passage, I want to know, will Jesus forgive us every single time we <laughs> sin and come to him? Does he ever get tired of us failing him? No, he doesn't ever get tired of us failing him. But I do think that you get tired of asking and you're ashamed of yourself. And it's you that's the problem, not Jesus. Mm -hmm. But uh, will he forgive? Yes. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Well, but we, we leave you with grateful. today's Power Minute from 1 John. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Well, tomorrow, the best-selling author whose stories have been uh, ripped from the headlines, Joel Rosenberg, uh, I read his book over the weekend. You'll find it fascinating. He's going to talk about the Kremlin conspiracy on tomorrow's 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us. And may God continue to bless you. And remember, we've got telephones all day long. If you have a need, don't hesitate to call in. We're here for you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.